started with our study session. Bob, it looks like you're unmuted and maybe the one leading us through this afternoon's study session. Yes, good afternoon and welcome everybody. It's always great to be together, even if it's raining <laughs> cats and dogs outside. Um, this is Bob Triansky. I'm the Director of Behavioral Health Projects for Douglas County. And this afternoon, we are going to spend some time with our colleagues from Behavioral Health Partners, um, which is a partnership between Burt Nash and LMH Health to operate and, and operationalize the crisis center that will be coming online in 2022. This presentation today kind of represents a transitional moment in the in the life of this project, in the sense that for the last year and a half or so, um, LMH Health has been responsible for providing project management and the planning and the development for the crisis facility, as well as uh, operational, um, legal, and financial uh, modeling. And what we're going to do this afternoon is to give you an opportunity to hear from this new entity, Behavioral Health Partners, as they share their proposal uh, to transition from the kind of the planning phase of this into the first part of the operational plan for the center. Um, this is going to require some significant investment um, to bring leadership on board, to um, put a management structure in place, and to be ready to uh, build the workforce that we need um, when we will uh, start offering these integrated services that we've been talking about for a long, a long time. So we're very excited to have this opportunity today to share, um, to give Behavioral Health Partners an opportunity to share their vision for what we need to get started uh, and how the county uh, what the proposal is to, for, for that support. If you remember from the budget process in July of 2020, uh, for the 2021 budget, um, the County Commission held a placeholder of uh, not to exceed amount of $1.875 million um, to support this work. And that was the frame um, th and the limitation that we talked about with behavioral health partners as they began assembling this financial plan. So I just wanted to set that as sort of the, the starting point for this conversation. Joining us today is Russ Johnson, CEO of LMH Health, um, Patrick Schmidt, CEO of Burt Nash, Stephen O'Neill, Chief Operating Officer of Burt Nash, and Jeanette Kirkpatrick, who is the Vice President of Clinical Excellence um, for LMH Health. In addition, I think it's important to keep in mind that in the case of Jeanette, Patrick, and Sarah Plinsky, you also have three board members from Behavioral Health Partners. So we have a, a wide range of perspectives um, and some real opportunity to start to dive into the complexity of the work. We've, we've spent a lot of time building relationships and, um, and uh, congratulating ourselves for hanging together. And now this is an opportunity for the, the commission to ha have some curiosity and questions about the plan uh, to move forward. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Stephen O'Neill, Chief Operating Officer at Burt Nash Community Mental Health Center. Stephen, I'm not sure if you could hear us, but I am unable to hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, can you see the presentation? Yes, we can. All right, great. Well, thank you, Bob, and thank you, commissioners and the other county staff on the call. It's our pleasure uh, to be here tonight. We're very excited. Uh, we've been doing a lot of uh, hard work uh, and we're eager to share that with you uh, and have some discussion uh, about uh, the next steps uh, in our crisis continuum of care. Uh, as Bob mentioned, Behavioral Health Partners uh, is a collaboration or joint venture uh, between Burt Nash and LMH Health. Uh, in the early on in the process, uh, both Burt Nash and LMH uh, expressed an interest uh, in leading and running uh, this crisis center that we're building. Uh, and we came together and said, wouldn't it be great if we leveraged the expertise uh, and knowledge of both of our organizations so that we can really ensure 
uh, that our community members have access to uh, the best uh, care uh, when they need that care. Uh, and that is how Behavioral Health Partners was formed. Uh, and it is a 501 uh, C3. Uh, and we hope uh, to hold the contract to operate the crisis center. Uh, Jeanette, turning it over to you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, commissioners, uh, good evening. And in December, our, our board of directors for the crisis center was identified to oversee our business and affairs uh, related to the bylaws um, and daily operations. The primary function of that board is our strategic planning and oversight of the crisis recovery center. In all, we have um, nine board members. Obviously, the Douglas County Commissioners appointed three, Burt Nash and LMH three as well. And we did complete the orientation of our board as of March of 2021. We are currently actively recruiting our executive director for the facility to manage our day-to-day -day operations in conjunction with our medical director. Our hope is to complete that interview process uh, with the board of directors and, and select that leader by June of 2021. I will say that we have um, several excellent candidates and we are looking forward to moving more deeply into our interview uh, process in the next week. And as we are, um, you know, if we're really integrating these complex processes and with our partnerships and with our other community caregivers in the community, we have some core service lines that Stephen will be talking to you about in a bit, but the crisis center is a piece of that larger care continuum, and it includes pieces to ensure that our community members really are receiving the right care in the right place at the right time. And so Russ and uh, Patrick are going to talk to you now a little bit more about our, our guiding principles and our, our desire for excellence. Russ. Russ, I believe you're on mute. You gotta do that yeah. once, at least once a day when you have 10 of these. Um, uh, thanks to the commission for taking some time uh, and sharing that with us on this. Um, in, I, I think um, in my experience, a, a collaboration is um, can add complexity, it can add challenge, it can add difficulty, but it can also bring out the very best um, in um, the service or the opportunity. Uh, today, I was out at the fairgrounds and I think uh, we saw the last vaccination clinic. And I think that's kind of a testimony to how collaboration can really work well. And, and I think um, we're seeing that in this effort too, uh, with a number of years ago, the county's really encouragement of our establishment of the Behavioral Health Leadership Coalition, and, and frankly, getting partners like Burt Nash and LMH to um, work together in a much more intentional way, instead of, um, you know, maybe a history of being a little passive about um, our role in the community. And so um, I think that effort has led to this um, proposal where um, we form a collaboration to operate the crisis and recovery uh, center um, with the best of both organizations at mind. And, and so um, starting with that backdrop, um, we shared amongst us, what are gonna be the guiding principles that hold us together as a collaborative? And to which we both commit um, knowing full well as we navigate this um, we're going to run into hurdles. We're going to run into some challenges. Um, much of what we're doing is going to be really innovative and new, um, certainly for our community, but candidly for almost all communities. And, and so I think it was um, um, these ideas came out of our um, discussion. Um, and I think there's five or six of them. The first one starting with this notion of a, a commitment to excellence and mutual success. Um, and that starts first, this commitment to excellence starts with a notion around who we're caring for. And, and that um, ultimately, while we all have an important stake in this, um, in this service, 
It's all about our, um, our patients and families and community members and friends that we're gonna serve. And secondarily to that, about um, a mutual success between our organizations and the county and the community more broadly, that that needs to be um, our first and most important precept. And then quickly after that, ideas like trust and respect and innovation, um, which speak to how we want this relationship to work together well, and knowing that even when we come up against difficult issues, we're going to do that in the context of, I'm committed to this partner, I trust them and their intent, and I have respect for, for our differences. And, and now I think we even have some stories already that are a testimony to that and some decisions we've made and some challenges that we've worked through. And then I think this notion of innovation is critical because we're plowing some new ground here. And, and uh, Bert Nash and LMH and the county all bring some skill sets and we bring our little toolkit that we know and that we trust, but sometimes we're gonna need to have um, a different tool or we're gonna need to look to our colleague to solve it and to be willing to be innovative. And then lastly, um, this notion of stewardship, uh, we're, we're very mindful that this involves patient funds um, and county funds and that we need to bring, uh, to bring um, our best practices and our best um, favored nations, if you will, ideas so that this partnership is um, efficient and it's effective and it's ultimately about um, serving our community. So we just thought it was important for us to share with the commission the ideas that are guiding us and how we come together and how we advance this work together. And let me, um, let me have my uh, friend and colleague, Patrick, um, add whatever thoughts he has to this, um, to these thoughts. Great, thank, thank you, Russ. And thank you, uh, commissioners and county staff and others for joining us or inviting us in today and, and listening in on uh, what we find to be a very exciting uh, time uh, for our two organizations and really for our community. Um, and really in the short time that our two uh, uh, agencies have really come together to work through things and some of the challenging things, and I get to share a couple of those stories, um, you know, we're certainly partnering and working together on the design facility, bringing each of our own perspective and experience uh, to that table uh, for different parts of the building and being able to say, okay, this, this is where we have expertise and this is what we think and this is where you have it. And, and so we've done that around almost every area of the building. Uh, I was... Uh, uh, right before this, I was in a meeting, we were talking about the building and, you know, and in that meeting, the, the expertise of LMH Health and their team is, is, is taking the lead. And I, that's what I said to Starla, she's, she's, this is your guys' area. You know this stuff. We're here to support that and answer any basic questions, but you've got this. And so we're doing, those are the kinds of things they've worked around uh, issues about staffing and who hires who and who puts who where and what's the expert expertise we need. I, I tell you, if, if you if you're involved in healthcare at all, you know that healthcare providers have a love hate relationship with their electronic medical record. Uh, we love to hate it and talk bad about it ourselves, <laughs> um, but we won't do it externally. Uh, but so both of us have our own electronic health records, um, but we heard presentations from both, um, looked at the advantages and disadvantages of both. And um, despite us being very invested in ours, we said, gosh, this one is uh, Cerner's, uh, the one that LMH uses, is absolutely the best one for this environment. It may not be the best one for our environment over here, but it's going to be the best one. So we very quickly said, hey, we're partnering to go with the Cerner product. That means our team has to learn a new, a new EMR and we have to change some of our billing processes and stuff. But again, what was 
what was the greater good and what was for the best for this endeavor together. So that's a couple of uh, examples. We've done that around finance and billing and revenue cycle management. A lot of things that uh, we both do very well on our own, but we're coming together on and building bridges on how to do it together better. So uh, I'm just really excited about it. And thank you for uh, hearing us tonight. And I'll turn it back over to Stephen and Jeanette who will walk us through uh, the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Patrick. So uh, where we're gonna go next is to talk about the pre-funding agreements. Uh, but before we go there, I wanna pause uh, and just remind us all of what the crisis uh, and Recovery Center is, what its three uh, core service lines are, uh, and how uh, it will support the community. Uh, so the Crisis and Recovery Center will operate 24 hours uh, a day, uh, seven days a week, uh, 365 days a year. Uh, we are really hoping uh, that we are the first or second um, entity uh, in the state to receive uh, a designation as a state of Kansas crisis intervention center. Um, the three main service lines are the access center, uh, which is the, uh, it's literally the front of the building. Uh, and uh, any community member can walk in there um, Monday through Friday, uh, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, and eight hours on the weekend that we're still sorting out uh, and have access to a full array of uh, behavioral health uh, services uh, and resources. Uh, after hours, if someone were to show up, uh, we do have the ability to manage folks through uh, a side entrance after hours. Uh, the second component is a 23 hour observation unit. Uh, the front, uh, the access center, we serve the full human lifespan. Uh, uh, in the next two components, it's adults only, 18 and over. Um, so children who go to the access center, uh, their next right place uh, is not going to be further in our building, uh, but will be back in the community uh, or another uh, facility. Uh, but for adults who need some more intensive treatment, uh, the next uh, program line is the 23-hour observation unit. Uh, and this is where folks can stay for up to 23 hours to get some really assertive uh, support uh, and care and treatment through medication, uh, uh, through uh, uh, counseling, through resource linkage, and just the ability uh, to rest and recover uh, in a safe space. Uh, and the last uh, service component is the stabilization unit. And this is for folks who need a little bit more time uh, on their journey uh, to recovery and back to the community. Uh, and, and folks can go there and stay, uh, we think uh, on an average up to 72 uh, hours. So I just wanted to remind us all uh, of the uh, primary service lines uh, and the hours of, of operation. Uh, and while we're talking about uh, the pre-funding agreement tonight, I'll just remind everyone uh, that the annual operating budget of the Crisis and Recovery Center uh, currently stands uh, the pro forma at around $6 million a year. Uh, and we estimate somewhere between 65 and 80 uh, behavioral health uh, personnel uh, will operate the building uh, in addition to uh, support staff uh, from either LMH Health uh, or Burt Nash. So I just wanted to stop and give that uh, reminder, it's a very large project. Um, so um, now we'll go into talking about the pre-funding agreement. So Jeanette, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Stephen. So as we have worked with the county, uh, this has been an evolving process with LMH. We will talk more deeply about the integrated crisis team expansion project, but it's important to note as we walk through the pre-funding agreement in the in this session that LMH currently has a shared contribution to this project and um, we are covering the director's costs and the insurance costs for four of the uh, behavioral health clinicians in our emergency department. As we enter into this agreement um, with our goal of July 1st, 
um, the previous agreements that we have had with the county will um, sunset and the new agreement will be with Behavioral Health Partners collectively versus LMH Health. All right, so as Jeanette said, this is really an evolution uh, of all the work that has come uh, before. Uh, and what we put before you tonight will, as Jeanette said, uh, replace uh, some of the existing agreements. The pre-funding agreement we're gonna talk about the, tonight uh, will support the development of the center uh, in 21, uh, leading to its opening in early uh, 2022. Uh, we currently anticipate needing 2021 funding of one, uh, million two hundred and fifty six thousand eight hundred and twenty four dollars and thirty six cents uh, to cover the operational and development costs of the center. The vast majority of what we're asking for are personnel expenses and I want to pause here uh, just to make sure that everyone has a, a copy of the budget as well as the budget narrative before uh, I start uh, working through these slides here. Yeah, I see heads shaking. Okay, that's good. So the vast majority of what you will see are personnel expenses uh, and, and uh, 469,400 of that are leadership and management costs attributable uh, to onboarding an executive director uh, and onboarding a medical director uh, we and, uh, hope uh, to have them onboarded mid-year. Um, we also have other uh, position costs totaling $46,394.06. Uh, these are support staff uh, in this instance from LMH Health, although uh, when we get into like the operational budget for 22, uh, you'll start to see more of these positions, not just from LMH Health, uh, but also Burt Nash. But these are sort of the back office or infrastructure related uh, positions uh, that, that will make the center work. So what we're asking for in 21 uh, is to support uh, personnel to do things like get our facility uh, started on joint commission accreditation, uh, which is really a gold standard uh, in facility-based uh, behavioral health care. Uh, it's to um, uh, infection control, uh, clinical educators, folks that are really going to set up uh, policy and procedure uh, so that we can go live uh, on time uh, with the opening of, uh, of the crisis center. The next uh, uh, personnel bucket, and this is another large one, just like leadership and management costs, are what we term the development team costs. Uh, these are all of the costs associated uh, with our staff's time, uh, whether that is IT uh, or finance staff or our clinical staff uh, who are focused uh, and dedicating uh, portions of their time uh, to getting uh, the center operationalized uh, and ready uh, to go. Um, and you have a lot of detail uh, about the breakdown uh, of those development team costs uh, in your packet uh, and happy to uh, discuss any of those in more detail. Uh, and the last uh, bucket, uh, and this is a small one, is that we do anticipate uh, in December uh, of this year, hiring a, a limited number of staff um, uh, that will actually work uh, in the facility uh, as direct care staff. So Jeanette, I'm going to uh, uh, check with you just to make sure I didn't uh, miss anything. And then I think this would be a great place to pause uh, to have discussion uh, and question on these personnel specific items. Uh, thank you, Stephen. That's a great summary. Summary. The only thing I would add is, as Stephen talked about the personnel, and as Russ and Patrick talked about, our you know creating an, a center of excellence. 
we want to make sure that we know that people need excellent care. So we're really integrating our medical model of healthcare delivery with behavioral care. So that includes our substance use in collaborating with our community partners, as well as managing that behavioral care. So, you know, we're going to strive so to really create that environment for patients who may not often always see the um, the best side of healthcare when they're entering healthcare into crisis and striving to show them something different than they've had in the past while working in one facility with several community partners and helping that medical team really blend that model for our patients in our community. All right. I would love to take any clarifying questions from uh, commissioners uh, or just questions in general uh, about the personnel expenses or or about the center uh, generally before we move on. This is Commissioner Portillo. I don't have any questions at this point. Commissioner Reed or Commissioner Kelly, do you have questions? Neither do I, thanks. I, I have a, a couple of questions. Um, so, I mean, part of the thinking I thought behind the center, and, and maybe I'm wrong, is that it would reduce the costs at um, LMH and at Burt Nash. I mean, it, it, you, you would see some of the patients that are currently showing up in our emergency room will be served by the crisis center. Is that correct? Or did I help me remember that, please? Is that right? Uh, yes, one of the primary uh, functions of the crisis center is to divert people uh, from the emergency room, from the hospital, from jail, uh, who would be better served by a behavioral health uh, crisis center such as this, Commissioner Kelly. So when we look at that development team, and I saw the mention of that and really appreciate that there is more hours put into that development than you've actually budgeted for that. Is that true? It is, is Burt Nash and LMH, are they covering some of the costs of that development in this plan or not? Uh, yes, I, I, I don't know that I can quantify that for you, um, but our IT teams, our finance teams, our clinical teams are putting in significant hours uh, on the development uh, of this center. The other thing is uh, the time that Jeanette and I spend, uh, as well as Patrick and Russ, uh, was not included in these costs uh, at all. And I do view that as a contribution uh, to the project. That being said, uh, resources are still limited uh, and we do need to ask for some support uh, for our uh, team members. But I did want to clarify that these are not uh, uh, executive staff. These are IT uh, workers, finance workers, folks that are putting in long hours uh, to make sure this project is successful. And I don't know if any of uh, my colleagues, Russ or Patrick or Jeanette would have anything uh, to add there. Thank you, Commissioner Kelly. I, I think, Jeanette, go ahead. So I, I was just going to add, you know, our goal is, is transparency. And so the reason that we're providing that information for folks at LMH who may be providing that extra hours is to make sure that we have communication so that we are openly discussing where we have folks assisting us. You know, some other are areas that Stephen, um, you know, in addition, we have some of our facilities workers and, you know, our supply chain. And as this can, as our development and operations continue to evolve, um, we will be seeking the expertise uh, of those individuals on an ongoing basis. So trying to show, um, in a forward and a thoughtful manner to commissioners in, in our community of where we're utilizing resources and where we will need some of those more formal resources on an, on an ongoing basis. Russ? Um, I, I mean, my thought, I think Patrick, part of your question is getting to the notion of, of this as a shared value proposition for everybody, right? And 
Um, and, and one of the reasons that we put in stewardship as a value is because we wanted to be front facing about, um, you know, LMH or Burt Nash, nobody gets a windfall out of this opportunity. Um, the idea is to create um, maybe the highest standard of, not maybe, I think, I looked at Bob and I knew he wouldn't like that word. Um, uh, it's to create the highest standard of care for our patients. And, 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 and it's certain, the, the certainty of this to me is that patients are going to be cared for more effectively and more appropriately. And, and I, I think while we're in this development phase, I have no doubt that Burt Nash and LMH are contributing resources well beyond what we're charging for. Um, but I think it also, your question also goes beyond that. Once the center is up and running, you know, Sarah and, and us have had this conversation about really understanding and being open about the value proposition it creates for all of us and including the hospital. So if this ends up being a significant benefit to the hospital's um, cost structure because of it better manages emerge, um, uh, you know, crisis patients, then we're gonna wanna see this be successful just like the county is and just like Burt Nash is. So um, I think our commitment, Patrick, is right now, we, are, we believe we're absolutely contributing um, in kind, if you will, or whatever the right way to put that is. But we also know that um, to make this work, it will take a community endeavor um, and we're committed to that. Yep. Uh, thank you, Russ and Jeanette. Patrick, did you have anything to add on that? You know, the three of you have covered it very well. Yep. So I yeah. guess ask uh, Commissioner Kelly if he has any follow-up on it. No, I, I oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. I just, uh, I, I wanted to understand, because I think, you know, this is really unique for our community. It, it's just really different than anything we've ever done before and how, how transparent we are and not that I think anybody's trying to hide anything. I just think sometimes for a sake of simplicity, we, we try to, sh we, we use that word stewardship and we know what we're in on it for. But I mean, these, this is tax dollars that our community has voted for. And I think we just need to be really clear. Um, I, I appreciate what you said, Russ. I, I don't think anybody's making a windfall on this, but I think we need to be clear that if, if there are value adds that those value adds show up on both sides of the ledger, you know, for, for the crisis center and for LMH and for Bert Nash, you know, so that we just see those things there. I don't think anybody's trying to hide anything. I think I yeah. totally, I appreciate uh, that trust, but I think it's just important, you know, for us as stewards of those taxpayer dollars to make sure that, that we're clear on that. Um, and it may be helpful, I don't know, to sort of, you know, do some estimations of what those costs are at this time so that as we go forward, we can say, oh, okay, that's where we think those are. We can sort of balance those out. Bob, it looks like you have your hand raised. Yeah, I just wanted to throw one thing in, in as the guy who reviews invoices that come in because, you know, LMH has been stewarding this as a project manager, like I said, for, for close to two years now. And um, one of the things I asked Jeanette to do as, as we're invoicing is show us what you're billing us for, but then show us the additional time that's, that's being put in by LMH. So for example, if you review those invoices, you'll see significant time that's been put in by the IT staff as one example that has not been charged to the county as part of the project management uh, cost. So it gives us a sense of that. I mean, I would say that our experience over the last two years has been that LMH in this project management role has been very responsible with stewardship dollars. And we haven't tracked the hours, as Stephen was saying, that the Burt Nash team has, has put into this. So you know, I, I think that's important because I would just say our experience has shown um, a lot of transparency around this and also kind of a spirit of wanting to 
wanting to do the right thing in the way that everybody is speaking to. And then Commissioner Kelly, I would just add to that, you know, early on, Burt Nash and LMH entered into a lease agreement uh, regarding some of our clinicians to ensure, you know, that we were able or to actually develop a process to be able to offset some of those costs and um, for the pass through charge to the county to and so we're continuing to build that process work on on those revenue streams to to be as responsible as we can be. Yeah, and I would just add, I think you see efficiency, even in how we designed it, uh, because instead of one accreditation person, it's a half instead of one clinical educator, it's a half or a third. So we're still benefiting if, if it was a standalone facility, you know, you would likely have one of something uh, instead of a half. And then we're not adding things where we don't need to, but a great example of where operational capacity doesn't currently exist um, is I estimate that the crisis center will generate 23,000 individual billable claims a year. We don't have somebody at LMH uh, or Burt Nash just sitting around uh, that has capacity for 23,000 billable claims. So that's an area where we do have to ask for that support because it's critically important uh, that we bring the $3 million in fee for service revenue in uh, to leverage with uh, the $2.8 million significant uh, investment uh, from the county. But we aren't adding things uh, if we can realize if that capacity already exists. But I think that's a great example of where we have no choice uh, but to ask for that support in order to make the facility work. This is Commissioner Portillo. I really appreciate all of the transparency and the background on all of this. And Bob, I think your explanation of asking LMH to help us understand some of the in kind ways that they've contributed to the stewardship of this project is really helpful. I think Commissioner Kelly also brings up a really important point of some of those indirect benefits that this crisis center is supposed to bring to both Burt Nash and LMH. Is there a space where we see those kind of all laid out for the community? And are there ways where we're going to be able to track some of those? Russ, you mentioned that and it's important for us to think through them, but will that type of information be shared back with the board for the behavioral health partners? What type of information plan do we have there? And how can we fully account for some of those when we have other really complex things happening around this? So for example, we're hoping that the crisis center will bring down the use of the emergency room at LMH, but we're also seeing Advent Health come into our community and stand up urgent care. And how do we know, how do we account for all those indirect pieces that are happening in our community? I'll, I'll take a crack at it. So um, I think we will be measuring a lot of data at the crisis center, you know, uh, both client, ex uh, like, client level, patient level data, but also community impact data. And a lot of these folks um, who I think will get the most benefit, uh, we know who they are, right? Uh, we know how many days they were in the jail or how many times they were in the ED. And I do think we'll be able to uh, make some, even accounting for some of the other variables uh, you mentioned, Commissioner Portillo, I still think we will be able to deliver uh, a level of data and accountability that hopefully shows uh, the positive impact uh, that the crisis center is having on the community. And I think that I know, oh, I know that that'll be a critical part of uh, what is shared with the Behavioral Health Partner Partners Board uh, and also this commission uh, as we come back um, uh, to give updates about how things are going. Uh, again, wanting a high level of transparency, not just on the financial management of, of things, but what are the outcomes and what is the positive impact uh, to, uh, to the community? And I think things like our data sharing warehouse initiative 
um, that exists where we're able to pool our data together and look at more population health type things, I think that will, will help. So that's my crack at answering that. Uh, but uh, I don't know, Russ, Jeanette, yeah, Patrick. I, I think um, uh, maybe commissioner, it would start with us really understanding. Um, yeah, uh, here's some thoughts. One, I think that we can come forward with areas of impact. And where do we think um, the potential is for moving parts in this uh, relationship? Um, and, and maybe bring those forward um, to the board and have transparency around that. And then also see if that, um, if that gets to your question specifically. Um, and then what the implications are of that. Okay, so um, if, if, the, if the hospital does some research and says, gee, you know, our, um, our uh, crisis, uh, mental health crisis visits went bound by 2,200 visits last year, and, and we had a revenue stream of this and a cost of this, you know, what is the implications of that? And, and what does that mean? Um, and, um, and so I think, um, uh, uh, for me, what I want to do is make sure I'm understanding exactly what pieces of information you all feel would be valuable and then how, what's the idea of how we would use that. Um, and, and so, and just be open and candid about that conversation. Yeah, this is Commissioner Bertugan. I think that it is a complicated question because a big part of what we've said as part of this entire process is this will also help with healthcare overall in our community. And so how do we really kind of show that to our community and who are the stakeholders in that conversation? It yeah. sounds like behavioral health partners are one really important set of, that board is one really important set of stakeholders, but those are appointed in part by you all, in part mm -hmm. by Bert Nash, and in part by us. Mm -hmm. And there's not necessarily a fully public facing piece of that. And since this is taxpayer money, I think that we really need to think through how do we convey like, the overall community benefits to the public as well. Right. I think, so, you know, so, uh, this is Patrick Schmitz, as, as I think about it, I think our timelines or timeliness to access to care. You know, right now we're tracking how quickly does it take to get in to see a therapist uh, for an evaluation? How quickly do they then get to their next first appointment where treatment really begins? How quickly do they access a psychiatrist and get actually started on some medications? I think those are the things we'll be able to track um, and be able to show. I think the harder things won't, and, and maybe there's data out there. What is it, what right now, if I am in crisis, what does it take for me to get to the next safe place? Right now, we know it could take days. If I am in a mental health crisis and I need a safe place, I could be sitting in an ED for days before I get into a safe place. We'll be able to hopefully get somebody in there within minutes if that's the level of care. And so we'll track that stuff. What's that time frame for law enforcement or emergency personnel to be able to drop somebody off and get them hand it off and then back out to where they're going. So I think those will be some of the things we'll be tracking. How many people from Douglas County end up at uh, Osawatomie or Larned versus stay here in our community and get the treatment they need and get engagement with their family and their friend he, friends here versus being totally disconnected from them because of geography. So I think those are some of the things we'll be monitoring. I think we'll see those as benefits. And indirectly, those are benefits to us, uh, uh, to us, each of us as providers, uh, because it eases our clinicians and our workforces struggles getting people to that next level of care that they know they need. And that is honestly a frustration for them. Jeanette, yeah. go ahead. Sorry, Patrick. Commissioner Perdue, the other thing I think that is important is we're developing some of those policies and procedures now in our emergency department with our expansion team and with some interim medical director services to test some of those accept, uh, assumptions that we have to provide that care, to work on the, the, the streamlining and our integration now so that when we move that to the crisis center, we will have some of those uh, processes already in place. 
One suggestion that I might have is last night there was a community listening session around mobile crisis response. I think a platform like that could be an excellent way to share updates uh, about how things are going, to be very uh, transparent with the information, uh, and to get community member feedback on their experiences um, with some of these new initiatives uh, that we're doing, because uh, it is uh, all of our uh, uh, crisis and recovery center, everyone uh, in this community. Uh, and I might that might be a very interesting platform. And I'm sure there's lots of other ways uh, to make sure we can uh, hear from the community and, and get that feedback and share the information. Can I make one, one more point, which is, I think another value of the relationships that we've talked about forever now is that when we started really working together, one of our commitments was to establish baseline data and to really start to track with specificity a whole variety of metrics. We've spent three years doing that. So in terms of knowing where we were beginning in 2017, 2018, and being able to measure how these new resources and facilities and approaches shift that, I think there's no reason why we ought not be able to um, really do a great job of that. And I think that's one of the values of the data sharing collaborative work that the pub that public health has pulled together and some of the reporting that we've done to find you know, Douglas County specific data so that we're not just comparing ourselves to state trends and national trends because the reality is Douglas County is very different in a lot of ways. Um, not always for the better. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I think that we learned a lot by the work that was done on the criminal justice side that says we must be data driven in our thinking and our approaches. Um, and I, I'm very confident and grateful for the baseline data work that's been done over the last three years. I, I have another question about personnel, but I want to make sure we give space to Commissioner Reed in case. <laughs> She has any questions? Oh, so, um, Stephen, I think I heard you say, you know, that one of the things we see some 0.5 positions on there because we can see some overlap between the two. Can you talk a little bit about the medical director position? Um, you know, I think I think I understood that was 0.5. Is it 0.5 because it's six months? Is it 0.5 because it's half time? Is it half time uh, because we have psychiatrists otherwhere that are in both camps? Sure. So it, it our current plan, although there's uh, always discussion uh, as we learn and, and uh, get feedback from our psychiatric infrastructure work group, which is a collection of, of medical providers and other groups. Uh, but the current plan is that we would have a half time uh, medical director uh, for the facility. Uh, so it's not in this case half an FTE because it's half a year. That is actually the cost of half of a psychiatrist for half of a year. Um, so given the size of our facility operationally, uh, we believe that a half time uh, medical director uh, can uh, support uh, the facility. That does, we have other. Uh, full-time med providers in that facility working. Uh, we believe a half time of sort of executive level medical director oversight uh, can support that, uh, that operation. One way to look at it is, you know, the front of the building, the access center, we're doing that in, in a lot of respects now. And we have a psychiatric infrastructure uh, to support the provision of that outpatient care. So what we're talking about really is a medical director uh, for 16 um, observation uh, recliners uh, and eight uh, stabilization uh, beds, which we believe can be done with a half-time medical director. But the cost you see in front of you is the cost of half of a psychiatrist for six months less uh, 52,000 uh, that's going to pay for the interim. Uh, 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 Dr. Thompson, who's working in an interim capacity, 
uh, at LMH Health. Did you, sorry, did you follow me there, Commissioner Kelly? I apologize if I was. No, I, I completely followed you and I learned that I should have gone into psychiatry instead of education. But um, so that follows, that leads me to two more questions. One is how does that align with the highest level of care? I mean, we say we want to help any person, anytime, whatever kind of care they need. Did I get that right, Bob? I mean, that's the, that's the sort of the, the runnings thing we say, but if we only have a medical director half time, is that, are you all confident that we can give enough care, the type of care that we need to the clients that come in? So I think it's important to understand, I mean, there's going to be a lot of providers um, in that facility around the clock. We'll have a full-time uh, advanced psychiatric nurse practitioner. We'll have a full-time executive director uh, that is a, a licensed behavioral uh, health professional. Uh, we will have clinically licensed uh, managers. We will have licensed nursing staff uh, in the building around the clock. And I'm gonna turn it over to Jeanette here uh, to elaborate on this, but a medical director is an administrative position. That is not a client serving position. And I think that's important to understand. And when we're trying to balance limited dollars for care, we have to, in, I think we try to push as many of those dollars as we can towards the patients and the folks that are going to be interacting with directly the patients uh, and facilitating that care. Jeanette, would you like to add to that? You know, I, I think the only thing I would add, Stephen, is that we are having some ongoing discussions, as you alluded to, with our psychiatric infrastructure group and mm -hmm. making sure that we are, you know, communicating with our partners and that APR and service we will have in the building. Um, there is a few hour break in the middle of the night, but making sure that we have that full continuum of care uh, for leasing that piece of the crisis center, um, you know, and then evaluating what may be need elsewhere in the community. And that's where we're working on those yeah. data-driven decisions with our other providers regarding access. And if, if we need- You know, to Commissioner Kelly, the thing I might add, just as a frame of reference, um, this is not at all unusual in a medical model. Um, so we have a skilled nursing and a rehab unit, uh, which has 16 to 25 patients, inpatients a day, a lot of complexity, um, a lot of uh, coming and going and, and support staff like Stephen and Rebecca are referring to. And our um, medical director is not full-time. And, and, and in, in fact, we probably have 15 or 20 medical directors across the hospital that are none of which are full-time. In fact, I don't know if we even have one. Um, and so at least in a medical model to Stephen's point where this role is overseeing the clinical delivery of care, not necessarily providing all of that clinical delivery of care. Uh, at least in that model, this is not uncommon, uh, but to your point and Stephen's point, um, this discussion is still in discussion and, and we are gonna find the right balance of what that should be. Um, and I think my underlying premise to this is we, we need to have flexibility no matter which way we go. We could find with a full time, wow, that's way more expensive and more firepower than we need. Or with a half time, uh, maybe we need to amp that up a little bit. So I believe the key to this is flexibility, um, but we also want to start on the conservative side of that ledger as long as we feel like we can provide some excellence in care. So, so Russ, to that point, do you see, and I'm sorry to hog this conversation, but I'm really, I think this person is such a critical part, whoever this is new, this is different. We need somebody who is working with our courts on this, right? Who are talking to judges, who are working with our attorneys, you know, to make sure that we're getting the, you know, those people who need care 
to the crisis center. Is that the exact, maybe I understood that that would be the medical director, but it, it sounds like you don't think that's that person. You think that is somebody else? Can, can you say more about that, Commissioner Kelly? Help me understand when you say the, the judges and stuff, getting them to help me understand where you're going with that or what you're trying to find out. Yeah, so, I mean, if, if we think, you know, and maybe I'm misunderstanding the role of this, uh, of the crisis and recovery center, but if, if one of, if helping the community understand, because I don't think we've fully articulated to the community yet and to all our community partners, the role that this, this place is going to play in, in our lives and in helping our community and make our community safe. Who is that point person that's out there saying that? Commissioner I Kelly, that's... I would imagine that that would be the executive director who is full time. The medical yep. director, I'd imagine, is much more of a prescriptive role of what kind of medical services are internal. So that's more internal facing. Right. Executive director is external facing. That's, that's what I'm asking right. our partners, Commissioner Trujillo, is that is that that's what you're thinking? I just want to confirm that that's yeah, what you're so, thinking. Yeah. So the intent is, well, one, I think that a lot of that comes from the behavioral health leadership coalition more broadly, right? We all have a responsibility to make sure the center works, but the role of that executive director uh, is to have uh, those uh, relationships and those connections with the courts and all of those other systems uh, to make sure that the center is working as intended. Uh, that, that is not the intent of the role of the medical director uh, whose job is more focused on the clinical oversight of the facility uh, and ensuring that we have the protocols and procedures uh, in place uh, uh, to deliver that high quality care. Although the executive director uh, will also have uh, that responsibility. Uh, but again, uh, one of our primary uh, uh, commitments is stewardship uh, and a full-time medical director right out of the gate uh, would be 8% of the total budget of the entire facility. Um, and I, I think that that's really important uh, for us to, uh, to think about. Jeanette, what are your additional thoughts there? No, I, I'm I'm supportive of that. It's it's scalability and to uh, Commissioner Portillo's comment, the executive dire director is really that outward facing. You know, how do they uh, manage and assist with those community partnerships? With the, um, you know, again, we're still in discussion, so I hate to make final, um, you know, statements, but it's that communication with, uh, you know, our our psychiatric providers in the community, our, our patients that we are coordinating care outside of the crisis center to ensure that we have those referrals and warm handoffs and uh, you know really get them to the next best place for ongoing and future um, healthcare and service needs. Yeah, no, this is Commissioner Portillo. Um, I really appreciate the clarifying question that Commissioner Kelly put out there, and it, it made me think of another question of clarifying of roles. So we know that right now, when it comes to healthcare, we have some pretty drastic racial disparities in access to care and outcomes for care throughout Douglas County. That's that's one area where, unfortunately, we're not unique. And I think that when we think about behavioral health care, particularly with an innovative approach like this, how are we ensuring that racial equity and racial justice are core to this particular crisis center and whose responsibility will it be to really think through the racial disparities that we see in our healthcare system? This is Patrick Schmitz. I know that both uh, LMH Health and Burt Nash are, are uh, working a lot in these areas to improve our mutual teams. Uh, ability to better address that and to outreach it. And I confident that the, the partnership uh, will continue to work in this area. Um, I, I don't think we have a specific person identified to focus on that, but again, we're kind of in the early stages. And so that might be something that as we get ready to launch in 2022, we identify either we have that personnel 
identified within our system or we need to create that capacity. And, that, and that's very similar to what we're talking about in the medical director. We're, this is where we're at right now. We may reevaluate later this year uh, how we have to change it. And that's that, as Ross talked about, it's that flexibility to adapt and adjust. Um, and that's something that we are learning to do. Well, you, you all learn, have, you all have learned to do it in your, your different careers. And we do that every day uh, in uh, healthcare. I, I, I could say, just, I'm, oh, go, ahead. go ahead. Yeah, if I could just jump in real quickly. I just want us to keep an eye on the clock. We've got, we're already at five o'clock. And so we need to, we've not gotten through the entire presentation yet. So I want us to keep focused on that. And, and just for the team members, um, we don't have to respond to every question right now. We can take that information and bring it back to commissioners at a later date as we get more defined details. So just as, if we can keep that in mind as we're working through this, I wanna gather commissioners feedback, but we don't have to necessarily solve it today. We've got a lot of time to continue to put that stuff together, so. Appreciate that guidance. All right. Well, I, I got a whole nother slide of really exciting stuff I can talk about. So should I, uh, should I continue commissioners or? Okay. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah. Right. So uh, th this is uh, <laughs> this is uh, exciting to some of us, uh, but these are the non-personnel operational expenses related to standing up uh, the crisis center. And I tried to lump them into uh, broad categories, but you've got a lot more detail uh, in the uh, uh, pre-funding uh, proposal. The most significant expense here is expenses related to uh, the electronic health record um, and uh, uh, IT. Uh, the electronic health record is $100,000 of the 146, and the rest is other types of uh, software uh, and software uh, licensing uh, needed uh, for, uh, for the center. The, the licensing accreditation dues and subscriptions uh, this has a lot to do uh, with the Joint Commission and pursuing uh, that gold standard uh, in behavioral health uh, care uh, and treatment. The education um, includes the acquisition of uh, several models that we'll use in the center, along with uh, the X waiver training that is required uh, for the medical staff uh, who will be providing a medication assisted treatment uh, connected to uh, the crisis center. Uh, outreach and communications is another uh, uh, larger item at 75,000. Uh, this is funds to uh, communicate about, engage with uh, the community around uh, the crisis and recovery center, uh, encouraging folks uh, uh, to use it uh, and to understand uh, how all of the parts and pieces of our crisis continuum uh, will be working together uh, to support them as an individual community member uh, and the community more broadly. The consultation line is $50,000 to continue uh, the agreement we have with Connections. They are a consulting firm uh, based out of Arizona They've been instrumental uh, to the work that we've done, and we're modeling our facility uh, in part based off of their facilities uh, in Phoenix and uh, Tucson. We do need some uh, patient-specific items uh, in 21 uh, to prepare uh, for the opening of the center. Uh, that amounts to $1,000. And then we do have $15,000 of miscellaneous expense uh, to account for um, market escalation in some of the other areas. Uh, and the total of all of that, as you can see, is $357,875. And that does uh, conclude the slides. So uh, Jeanette and I and Patrick and Russ can stand for more questions and discussion. I wanted to, I just want to go back to um, Commissioner Portillo's comment and uh, and I think health health equity starts with your chief executive 
And, and so the executive director and the medical director have to be committed to those ideas and, and willing to understand and explore how that looks differently in Lawrence. Um, that said, both of our organizations have some depth and expertise in this arena and some real, already some um, engaged clinicians and um, both nursing, physician, and others who are actively discussing and talking about health equity and how we as institutions um, learn more and do better. Uh, so, but I think it, um, I think it's, part of our of our executive director's job description and they have to champion that. This is Commissioner Portillo. Russ, I really appreciate that answer. Has that been an active part of the vetting process when I know you're actively going through recruitment of that executive director? How has that manifested itself in the search and interview process for the executive director? So that's a great question. The interview process has not started, so that will be an active component of the interview process. And as we get to the board of directors, there will be an engagement component um, uh, as part of the evaluation process that includes health equity and access. Um, I think it's also part of our data set that Bob alluded to that we can yes bring forward as results or lack of results, frankly, hopefully um, results in the future. And I think it's also important to mention that we are actively engaging with our population health team, our health equity advisors, beginning discussions, you know, ongoing discussions with our um, with the health department and Burt Nash to make sure that we are providing that holistic and the continuity of care to, uh, you know, eliminate social determinants where we can, but also barriers to access for whatever variety of reasons that they may be, that may not be an equity issue, but perhaps something else. This is Commissioner Kelly. I know we're wrapping up, so I, I do um, want to express my appreciation for this group. You've been working at this a long time, and I don't want us to lose track. You know, it's sometimes when we get diving in all the numbers and all the positions and who's paying who and where we lose track of what's really important. And what's really important here is that um, percentage of our population who are we are just not serving very well right now, that we have a duty um, to serve, that we have a responsibility to serve. And, and so you know, why we want to dig into every position, and I'm about to give you one more thing to think about, I do want to just thank you for staying continually focused on serving this population in a way um, that really, really addresses a gap in our communities. And, and, and so thank you for that. I would ask just, and I, I don't really need a response, but since you said you're still thinking about some things and things are still in play, I know you have some very talented marketing and communication at all three of our um, you know, our entities and to see $75,000 in marketing communication, which makes me, I jump back a little bit about that. That seemed like a large number. Um, and the same one with legal fees and my wife's an attorney, so I know what she charges, but so, I mean, that may be the cost of it, but, but I, those were numbers that sort of, when you look at those, um, and I know legal, what is still personnel, but those are ones I'd like you to, to just, tinker with a little bit and see if there's a way that we can get those down. We will we will take that uh, under consideration. Thank you. And Commissioner Kelly, this is Sarah. I'll add, uh, you know, those are areas that Bob and I are watching as well. And, and I think we've worked out that for purposes of this, you know, we're going to work collaboratively on, on what we're spending in those areas so that we can move forward in that realm. And I, I think what you've heard here is that there's just so much tremendous enthusiasm amongst this team for this work and, and for this, you know, incredible enterprise that we are embarking upon. And so um, I also am really grateful for this team and I'm grateful for the questions of the commissioners. This is, this is groundbreaking stuff. And uh, we need you to continue to ask us tough questions and push us as we move through this process and um, as to how we do this work. So, um, you know, I wanna thank the team. This is Commissioner Portillo. Thank you so much for this presentation this afternoon. It's been a delight to talk with you all.
Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you all. Thank Thanks you. to the county for their leadership on this. That's yeah, what's thank you. enabling this. Absolutely. Thank you. And with that, we will recess to our business meeting. At, oh, Commissioner Reed, for you. Yep, thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, I thank you all for this presentation. Um, I'm I'm really hopeful about um, some of the gaps and opportunity gaps this will fill and opportunities that can be created. Um, as somebody who does crisis intervention work in this community, and we have a you know pretty robust group of some uh, long-standing crisis intervention agencies in this community that are very specifically focused on types of crisis that people might be going through, domestic violence, suicide, um, ideation and attempts, um, sexual assault. And I think that, um, it, but there's always some folks that um, don't necessarily, one, we don't cover all the services and we can't provide all of the, the real crisis intervention and the medical interventions especially. Um, but also it's always been obvious that there are a lot of gaps um, in, it for not knowing where to refer folks to and looking to outside communities for resources that I'm really um, excited about having come to our county. So thank you all for that work that you've been doing. Um, this was really helpful. I think I just have one kind of question for to for later um, in future information. I'd like to see a little bit more um, kind of breakdown and understanding of what the direct care staff staffing looks like and um how many positions are we looking at what are you know starting salaries for those positions um looking like and to understanding like what value we are putting into people who are going to be front-facing staff and um who i would consider frontline workers and interfacing with our community members a lot so i'd just like to see a little bit more in that section um in the future about about what those numbers look like yeah, you'll see a lot of that in the actual funding of the center because that lays out a lot more in there. So, but thank you. I we really appreciate you thinking about that, asking that question because it's critical uh, that we're able to to show it and be able to discuss it because uh, it it is a challenge, and, and you know that very well in what you do every day. Um, and I, one other question that just came to me. Um, I know Jeanette, you mentioned that. You all have started doing some um, some training and kind of staffing internally in the in the ER now, I believe you said, or at the hospital to um, kind of get get ready to transition that staff and a team working together over to the crisis center. I was just curious, is that also happening on the Burt Nash side of things? Are you kind of both simultaneously doing that? So that's a great question, and we are working with Burt Nash together as a partnership in developing, we're just in the beginning stages of developing processes and with our emergency room physicians, with Dr. Thompson, with Burt Nash, creating that really that one team, that one workforce concept so that our clinicians can respond over to the crisis center if there is a need for an assessment, just as Burt Nash has provided us services for quite some time to really create that one team concept and ensure that we are providing the services where they are needed at that moment. So we have some work to do there, but we have begun that process. Great, that's and really I, smart, thank you. And I'd say that's an excellent segue to the conversation happening at the 5.30 business yeah. meeting agenda <laughs> on the ICT agreement expansion. So we can expound upon that in that conversation as well. Great. Thanks for the extra couple minutes, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll see everyone at 530. See Thank you. Soon. Thank you. Bye.